Hi everyone, my name is Juliana, and today Daniela and I will be going over PTSD and CPTSD. Before we begin, we will just be doing a land acknowledgement, and this is for Toronto, where X University is located. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, first, I'll begin with a quick introduction, then I will move on into what is PTSD, what is CPTSD, what are the warning signs, the similarities and differences, trauma and triggers, as well as trauma and avoidance. I will then pass it over to Daniela, who will go over treatments, PTSD and CPTSD in youth, some misconceptions about PTSD and CPTSD, self-care, supporting someone with PTSD or CPTSD, resources, as well as important points to remember. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, and complex post-traumatic stress disorder, or CPTSD, are psychiatric disorders that can occur in people who have experienced or witnessed traumatic events. Both disorders share similar symptoms but are slightly different. More on this will be explored in a later slide. It is a common misconception that PTSD and CPTSD only occur to war combat veterans, but this is simply untrue. PTSD or CPTSD can occur in people of all can occur in all people and at any age. Women are twice as more likely to experience PTSD. As well within the USA, three ethnic groups are also disproportionately effective and have higher rates of PTSD than whites. These groups include US Latinos, African Americans, and Indigenous peoples. As well, an estimated 1 in 11 people will be diagnosed with PTSD in their lifetime. PTSD is a disorder that develops in some people after experiencing a devastating or traumatic event. Most people recover from the trauma, but for those that don't, they may develop PTSD. Those who have been diagnosed with PTSD may feel stressed and frightened even when they are not in danger. This is due to our body's natural fight or flight response to fear and danger. People with PTSD can have intense and disturbing thoughts and feelings in regards to their traumatic experience long after the event has happened. Often they may relive the event through flashbacks or nightmares. They may also feel sadness, fear, anger, or feel detached from others, as well as may avoid situations or people that remind them of the traumatic event. They can also have strong, negative, and fearful reactions to something that may seem as minuscule as a loud noise or accidental touch. Symptoms can typically fall into four categories. Intrusion, which includes intrusive thoughts, involuntary memories, distressing dreams or flashbacks, and flashbacks can be so vivid that the person actually feels like they are reliving the experience or seeing it before their very eyes. As well as avoidance. This includes avoiding people, places, activities, objects, and situations that remind them of the event and that may trigger memories. There's also alterations in cognitive cognition and mood, which includes inability to remember important aspects of the event, negative thoughts that can be ongoing and lead to distorted beliefs about oneself or others, distorted thoughts about the cause or consequences of the event, often leading to wrongly blaming themselves or others, as well as an ongoing fear, horror, or anger. And lastly, alterations in reactivity. This includes being irritable, having angry outbursts, behaving in self-destructive mannerisms, or in having problems sleeping and concentrating. On the other hand, CPTSD is a condition where one experiences some symptoms of PTSD along with additional symptoms. These may include difficulty controlling emotion, feeling angry or distrustful towards the world, constant feelings of emptiness or hopelessness, feeling permanently damaged or worthless, feeling like you are completely different to other people, feeling like no one could understand what happened to you, avoiding friendships and relationships and finding that maintaining them varies very difficult, as well as experiencing disassociative symptoms such as depersonalization or derealization, as well as physical symptoms such as headaches, dizziness, chest pains, and nausea, and regularly feeling suicidal. Those with CPTSD are likely to experience emotional flashbacks. 
These are intense feelings that one felt during the traumatic event, such as fear, shame, sadness, and despair. They may react to these events in the present as if they are causing these feelings right now without realizing that they are having a flashback. CPTSD can be caused by child abuse, neglect, abandonment, domestic violence and abuse, repeatedly witnessing violence or abuse, torture, kidnapping, or slavery, being a victim of trafficking, or being a prisoner of war. Someone is more likely to develop CPTSD if they experience trauma at an early age, the trauma lasted for a long time, escape or rescue from their situation was unlikely or impossible, experienced multiple traumas, or were harmed by a loved one. There are typically four different types of warning signs. These include intrusive memories, avoidance, negative changes in thinking and mood, and changes in physical and emotional reactions. There's also two symptoms that children under six uh, may experience as well. So for intrusive memories, they are recurrent stressful memories, reliving the traumatic event in flashbacks, upsetting dreams, or severe emotional distress to reminders of the event. Avoidance refers to trying to avoid thinking or talking about the event, avoiding places, activities, or people that remind them of the event. Negative changes in thinking and mood refer to negative thoughts about oneself, others, or the world, hopelessness about the future, memory problems, and lack of interest in activities that they once enjoyed. Changes in physical and emotional reactions include being easily startled or frightened, self-destructive behavior, difficulty maintaining close relationships. And in children under six, symptoms may also include reenacting the traumatic event or aspects of the traumatic event through play, as well as frightening dreams that may or may not include aspects of the traumatic event. Now I'll be going over the similarities and differences between PTSD and CPTSD. So PTSD usually develops following a single episode of trauma. Some people have the capacity to forget and move on after the trauma, but this is not always the case. PTSD is also associated with behavioral issues and reckless activities, and sometimes dissociation. Treatment for PTSD usually involves short-term therapy and medication, while on the other hand, CPTSD involves several traumatizing events on a long-term basis. Patients will often get flashbacks and nightmares associated with insomnia. Sometimes they are also diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and dissociative disorders. Treatment for CPTSD involves multiple long-term therapy sessions in addition to medication. They may also suffer from social isolation as well as a fragmented sense of self. With PTSD, symptoms may come and go, and everyday loud noises can suddenly trigger memories, flashback, and fear. Triggers can include sights, sounds, smells, or thoughts that remind one of the traumatic event they experienced in some way. Some triggers can be obvious, such as fireworks triggering a war veteran, but sometimes they can also be unclear. Although everyone's triggers can be different, knowing your triggers can help you cope better while living with PTSD. Triggers are developed as a result of your brain not processing the trauma right away, and as a result, you can still feel stressed and frightened even when you know you're safe. Your brain then attaches these details like sights, sounds, and smells to that memory, and these details now become triggers. There are a few different types of triggers. For people, it could be people related to the trauma or somewhere, someone with a physical similar trait, as well as thoughts and emotions, such as the way you felt during the event like afraid or helpless, or things, which would be objects that remind you of the trauma, um, as well as scents, example, uh, fire or smell of a barbecue could remind someone of their house burning down, as well as places, so returning to the scene of a trauma or a similar place can be very detrimental, as well as TV shows and the news and movies with similar events can be triggering as well as feelings, sometimes sensations such as touch on a certain body part or pain can trigger, as well as sounds like gunfire, fireworks, or a car backfiring, as well as taste, example, alcohol, or situations like being stuck in an elevator may feel like being trapped after a car accident trauma, as well as anniversaries, specifically on the date of the trauma event is very triggering, as well as words, Reading or hearing certain words in relation to a traumatic event can also be triggering. 
Stay tuned for the upcoming slide with more information on how to manage your flashbacks and learn your triggers with Daniela. Finally, we'll be going over trauma and avoidance. Emotional avoidance is a common reaction to trauma and is also part of the avoidance cluster of PTSD symptoms. It's often referred to as the attempt to avoid distressing memories, thoughts, feelings, or reminders about a traumatic event or people related to the event. People with PTSD often try to avoid or push away their emotions in general, but especially those related to a traumatic event. Avoiding emotions may make PTSD symptoms worse or even contribute to the development of PTSD symptoms right after the event. Avoidance refers to any action designed to prevent the occurrence of an uncomfortable emotion such as fear, sadness, or shame. Many may try to avoid difficult and distressing emotions through drug and alcohol use or dissociation. Many engaged in avoidance may also have emotional numbing symptoms such as feeling distant from others, losing interest in activities that used to be enjoyable, as well as having trouble experiencing positive feelings. Different types of treatment can help you explore your difficult emotions without pushing away or avoiding. Daniela will speak about this next, about different types of treatment. Next, we'll focus on some treatments for CPTSD and PTSD. The first one is trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. This is a type of CBT that was developed specifically for PTSD. It consists of eight to 12 weeks of sessions with at least one session a week that ranges from one to one and a half hours. The next is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. This is a newer development to helping people with PTSD and CPTSD cope with and lessen their symptoms. The use of eye movement is supposed to simulate the way the brain functions and works through memories and experiences while sleeping. Medication is not a commonly used treatment for PTSD and CPTSD, However, it may be considered if there are comorbidities with other mental illnesses such as anxiety or depression. In these cases, it may be recommended that someone with PTSD or CPTSD try an antidepressant to see if this helps symptoms. Other therapies that are being researched include art therapies and dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT. PTSD and CPTSD in youth. Children ages 5 to 12 often have symptoms of PTSD show up differently than adults, as discussed during the warning signs portion of this video. They may also mix up the order of events that occurred. Teenagers often have symptoms that are similar to adults. The impacts of trauma can lead to odd behaviors such as anger, aggression, or changes in sleeping habits and negative feelings about oneself. If you're worried about PTSD or CPTSD in a child, it can be helpful to notice the following. Look for symptoms that have developed after a traumatic event. It's normal to have feelings of anxiety after experiencing or witnessing a traumatic event. However, it can be helpful to notice if this persists for more than a month. Also notice if a child is distancing or isolating themselves, potentially from certain people, as this can be an indicator of PTSD or CPTSD. Misconceptions about PTSD and CPTSD. The first misconception is veterans only get PTSD. This is inaccurate as anyone at any age can develop PTSD and CPTSD through any traumatic event. PTSD starts directly after a traumatic event. PTSD can develop long after a traumatic event. In fact, some people develop delayed onset PTSD where symptoms do not begin until at least six months after the event. The next misconception is people get PTSD due to weakness. PTSD is not developed through weakness and this perpetuates harmful notions and stigmas regarding PTSD and mental illness. This statement is inaccurate as PTSD and CPTSD are caused due to the brain's response to avoid harm. Anyone who has trauma is going to develop PTSD. Not everyone who experiences traumatic events will develop PTSD and there are various factors that can impact whether or not someone will develop the condition. The next misconception is all people with PTSD have the same symptoms. People with PTSD do not have the same symptoms, and this notion can be harmful as not all methods to help people will be the same. PTSD will go away with time. PTSD without treatment is not likely to go away with time, and often this stops people from receiving treatment. While it can be difficult to work through trauma, by seeking help, it can assist someone in removing the associations they have from their trauma and triggers. The next misconception is PTSD cannot be treated. This is a harmful notion as it prevents people from seeking treatments that do exist to help mitigate symptoms. 
Finally, a common misconception is when people with CPTSD are diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Due to this being a fairly new type of PTSD that is recognized, and as the symptoms are very similar between the two conditions, often people are diagnosed with borderline personality disorder when in fact it's CPTSD that they have. This can be damaging as treatments for the two conditions differ. It's important to understand the misconceptions as not only in the case of the last one where it can help with the diagnosis, but they also perpetuate stigmas, and by understanding them, we can work to deconstruct the stigma associated with PTSD and CPTSD along with mental illnesses. Next, we'll go over some self-care. First, learn your triggers. By learning your triggers, it can help you to take better care of yourself. When you learn about what triggers a flashback or can bring about a panic attack, it can help you prepare ahead for the situation where you know you will encounter a trigger, such as a particular date, or prepare for what to do if you happen to be caught off guard so that you can take care of yourself during these times. Talk with someone. Talking to a loved one, another trusted individual, someone else with lived experiences, or a professional can all be methods of self-care. It can be difficult to talk or trust others, but even if you just share how you are currently feeling rather than opening up about your trauma, you can help take care of yourself, which is a critical point in self-care. Be patient with yourself. It can be frustrating to live with PTSD or CPTSD, and no two persons' symptoms or stories are ever the same. Sometimes you might find that you need more time before talking to someone, or you might feel like you have taken steps back. When struggling with these thoughts and feelings, remember that you need to be patient with yourself and give yourself time. Take care of your physical health. Eating normally, exercising, taking a walk can all be beneficial methods of self-care. PTSD and CPTSD are exhausting, and sometimes it can be difficult to do small things every day, so simply eating a meal or drinking water can be considered self-care and can be one of the most important aspects of self-care. Self-care for flashbacks include breathing. Flashbacks can be terrifying, and as a result, you might find your breathing is irregular. Focus on breathing and counting can help you remain calm. Remind yourself you're safe. It can be easy to find yourself caught up in a flashback and feeling anxious. The most important thing is to remember that you are safe and to tell yourself that the traumatic experience is done and doesn't pose a current harm to you. It can be difficult to remember this during a flashback, so a useful tip is to write it down somewhere so you can revisit it when needed. Do something that you find comforting. Flashbacks can bring about stress and feelings of anxiety. Therefore, it can be helpful to do something that you find comforting. Being wrapped up in a blanket, watching a comfort movie or TV show, or hanging out with a pet are all great ways to comfort yourself during and after a flashback. Keep an object with you that will help keep you present. Some people have noticed that keeping an object such as a keychain or jewelry has been helpful with flashbacks. By keeping an object on you, it can remind you of the present moment to help get you through the flashback. Journal. By journaling, not only will you be able to write about your feelings and put them on paper, but it can also help you keep track of your triggers. If you write whenever you notice a flashback, it can help you to notice similarities within the situations and you'll be able to plan ahead. Finally, use grounding techniques. Grounding techniques can be very helpful during a flashback. A common grounding technique to use is to say five things you see, such as a window or a pet, four things you feel, such as your sweater or the floor, three things you can hear, such as the wind or the rain, two things you can smell, such as coffee or soap, and one thing you can taste, such as a mint. A grounding technique can help to keep you in the present and calm you. Supporting someone with PTSD or CPTSD. First, listen to them. Ensure to listen to them on their own terms, never forcing a conversation before they want to have one. It's also important to validate their feelings and to not assume or try to problem solve. By validating their feelings and experiences in a judgment-free space, it will allow them to feel safe coming to you in the future. If you aim to problem solve or assume, it can cause harm even if done with good intentions. Remain judgment-free. Often it can be difficult to see why an individual seems stuck on a particular situation, even years later. However, PTSD and CPTSD are mental illnesses, and it's important to ensure that you remain judgment-free in your support so that they can get better at their own pace. Educate yourself on their triggers. By doing this, it's an easy way to support them. You can learn what may trigger a flashback and prepare yourself on how to support them. Look ahead and prepare. Often symptoms can get worse with no warning, so it might be helpful on good days to go over and prepare for the bad days, such as learning warning signs, discussing a plan for support, or anything else that you feel is important to know, 
and the individual feels that they may need. Be mindful of their space. Often with PTSD, the person might feel jumpy. Be mindful of their space by avoiding startling them or touching them without their permission. Educate yourself about the warning signs. By doing this, you can better prepare yourself to notice when the individual's symptoms might be getting worse. Encourage them to find support. It's important to not force someone to receive help, but often having support when seeking help can be very useful and have a positive impact. Most important on this list is probably self-care. Sometimes those who support can pick up on secondary trauma. Therefore, it's important to look after yourself as well. By talking to other people or doing activities for yourself, you can look after your own mental well-being. To support someone through a flashback, be calm. Remind them that they are safe and they are having a flashback. Try not to move suddenly or avoid startling them. And guide them through breathing and grounding techniques mentioned earlier in the video. Next, we'll go over some resources. The most important thing to take away from this video is that there is help and supports available. For an immediate mental health crisis, reach out to a crisis line for support. For a non-immediate mental health crisis, a useful resource is For a Safer Space. For a Safer Space is a nonprofit that offers accessible and inclusive mental health care. Visit the website for more information if you would like to reach out for support. We're going to conclude this video with some important points to remember. The first being that PTSD and CPTSD are psychiatric disorders that occur in people who have experienced or witnessed traumatic events. There are a few differences and similarities between the two conditions, with one of the differences being the symptoms experienced. There are various warning signs including intrusive memories, avoidance, negative changes in thinking and mood, and changes in physical and emotional reactions. Triggers develop due to the brain not processing the trauma the right way, and there can be different types of triggers. Emotional avoidance is a common reaction to trauma. To continue with some of the important points to remember, there are different treatments for PTSD and CPTSD, with new research becoming available. PTSD and CPTSD can show up differently in youth, but there are ways to notice it. There are various misconceptions about PTSD and CPTSD, which can be harmful and perpetuate stigma. There are many methods of self-care that can be used daily or during a flashback. And finally, there are many ways to support a loved one, but it's also important to take care of yourself. That concludes this video on PTSD and CPTSD. Thank you for watching.